Well, in what time we have left today, I want to um, I want to share with you a life lesson from a person who was involved in that first Christmas. Today, I'm starting a series this month as we think about Christmas, and it's going to be life lessons from the first Christmas. And what I want to do is take a different character each week that we're so familiar with that we've read about, but I want to draw some lessons from their lives that we can learn about uh, from them uh, as we take a fresh look at the, the Christmas story that is so sweet and so wonderful to us. And today I'd like to draw a life lesson from the person whose name was Zachariah. You remember Zachariah and Elizabeth, they were an older couple, uh, probably at least in their 60s. They were probably much older than that, but they were probably at least in their 60s because the Bible describes them as being very old. And that term that's used there uh, was not referring to anybody who was not 60 or above, which makes me feel really good now um, that I'm over 60, so that's how the Bible describes me. But um, uh, they're an elderly couple. Zachariah has devoted his life to serving the Lord. He's a priest. Uh, he and Elizabeth are both from the family of Aaron, and they've devoted their lives. The God, God says of them that they were righteous in his sight, blameless devoted. And yet, now they're very old and they were childless. They had never been able to have children. And so now Zechariah, at an elderly age, is finally one day given the privilege, the highest honor that a priest would ever experience in their lifetime was when the lots were cast and their name was drawn to go in and burn incense in the holy place in the temple before the Lord. That, that was as good as it would get for an ordinary priest. And Zachariah had been waiting for that moment his whole life. Year after year, his name had never been called. And now finally in his old age, his name is called and he goes into the holy place there. This is, this is to be the, you know, the monumental pinnacle of his career and when he goes in there, he's as close to God physically as you can get because right past this curtain is the Holy of Holies. And nobody, no man gets to go in there except the high priest once a year for a very short period of time as he takes the blood in there, sprinkles it on the mercy seat and gets out. But the priest, he's there right in front of the veil and he puts incense on the burning coals of the altar which represented the prayers being lifted up to God. And while he's doing this, an archangel, Gabriel, appears to him. And the angel tells him, you're going to have a son. God's heard your prayers. You're going to have a son. He's going to be great. This boy is going to be great. God is going to use him to turn many of God's people back to him. He's going to bring you great joy. He's going to bring you great delight. Many are going to wonder in awe at what God has done through that boy's life. And Zachariah's response to that was, how can I know what you're saying is true? He responded in unbelief. And what we're going to learn today is that the reason for that, because he had been waiting on God for so long, he had been misinterpreting what was going on during this waiting, and he just got to where he wasn't expecting God to do anything anymore. His heart was inclined toward unbelief. And when you are inclined toward unbelief, when God does something, you don't even acknowledge that it's God. You just explain it away. Just a coincidence or just happened or it's just an accident or, you know, we, when your heart is filled with unbelief, then you don't even see God when he does act. And I want us to learn a lesson from him today. And here's the life lesson. 
when you're waiting on God, when God asks you to wait on him, it is because he is setting the stage to do something wonderful in your life and through your life. And some of you, many of us today, some watching right now, you're in a period of waiting and there's a real temptation to misunderstand and misinterpret what's happening when you're waiting. You can begin to think that God's not doing anything. You can begin to think God doesn't care, that God's overlooking you. You can begin to think all of that when the reality is God is working, preparing and setting the stage for a wonderful blessing in your life. So let's read together in Luke chapter 1, fairly long passage, but I want us to read it. Luke 1, verse 5. It was in the time of Herod, the king of Judea, that there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijai, and his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You're to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring many of the people of Israel to the Lord of their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make a people ready, prepared for the Messiah, the Lord. And Zechariah's response to this good news, how could I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife's well along in years. And the angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. And I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Now, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out because when they would, the priests would come out of the holy place, back out, the people were gathered, then they would issue this blessing over the people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. So he would give that priestly blessing. So the people were waiting for Zechariah, wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. And when he came out, he couldn't bless them. He couldn't speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple because he kept making signs to them, but he was unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months she remained in seclusion. And the Lord has done this, well, for me, she said, and these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now, if you skip down to verse 57, and when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. 
Now on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke and said to them, no, he should be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who's got that name. And then they made signs to his father. So they're signing. Now, it's interesting to me. The Bible doesn't say that he's deaf. The Bible says he can't talk. And they're sitting there making signs to him. That's kind of funny. They made signs to his father to find out what he'd like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote the name John. Immediately, his mouth was open, his tongue set free. He began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. And everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. God gets ready to send the promised forerunner to the Messiah, his son. He's going to send one who's going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And he's been preparing all these years for Zechariah and Elizabeth to have this boy and to raise this boy. This was going to be an extraordinary honor and privilege. God was going to use them to literally pave the way for the Son of God to come, the Messiah. What an extraordinary thing God had planned. From God's point of view all along, this was the plan. But Zechariah misinterpreted what was going on. Those years of waiting had caused him to misunderstand what God was doing. Now, if Zechariah could be here today and we could say to him, Zechariah, how in the world was it possible for you to be in the very temple of God in the holy place right next to the holy of holies and an angel show up and start telling you this message from God and you responded in unbelief? How is that even possible? And I think Zechariah would say to us today, well, it didn't happen overnight my unbelief sort of crept in over time. Just all those years of waiting. He said, you know, it had been, it'd been 400 years since the last prophet had been in Israel. Since there had been a word from God, there were 400 years of silence. The first message from God in 400 years was when the angel said, do not be afraid. So it, God had been talking, God had been silent, and our nation had been dominated now for hundreds of years by Babylon, and then the Medo-Persians, and then the Greeks came along, and now the Romans and we've been longing for God to send this Messiah and this deliverer who would deliver us from our enemies. But for hundreds of years, it just seems like God's been silent. God's done nothing, he thought. Besides that, my wife and I, Elizabeth, we've been, we prayed for years for a baby. God didn't answer our prayers. In addition to that, he said, I'm a priest. And it was the, the way the priesthood, there were 18,000 priests in Israel in that time. And as King David had done many years before, the thousands of priests, there were too many of them to show up and minister at the temple all the time, so they divided them according to divisions. There were actually 24 divisions. And each division... And he was of the division of Abijai. Each division would minister at the temple two weeks out of the year. One week early in the year, another week later in the year. Even then, there's 750 of them who would show up for this week of service. Way too many 
to be able to actually go in and minister in the temple. Now, they were busy taking care of other things, cleaning things up, repairing things, doing all kinds of stuff. But to actually get to go into the temple, there were only a handful that got to do that every day. And every day, they would cast lots. And only four people were selected every day. And once you'd been selected, you could never be selected again. And one group, one person selected would go in and he would stir the fires on the, on the, the altar to, that, where the sacrifices were done. One lot was taken and that person would actually prepare the sacrifice itself. One person would go into the Holy of Holies and trim the wicks on the candelabra and refill the oil. But the highest honor was when the lot fell on the person who would go in and actually offer the incense on the altar. That was the, that was the climactic point of this worship every day. And when a priest got to do that, they got to do that one time in their life. And I think Zachariah would have said to us, you want to know why my heart had become so full of unbelief? I'd been a priest for over 30 years. I'd spend a week, two weeks a year, and I kept waiting for my name to be called. For the, the Bible says in Proverbs 16 that the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So God controls that to where... So when that lot would fall upon a person, it was God saying, that's the person I want to do this today. And God would call them by name. And and Zachariah said, week after week, year after year, I would go and stand there among the hundreds waiting for God to pick me. And God never picked me year after year. And I'm now an old man, and I just thought God forgot about me, that I was just nobody special to God, that I just... God had just overlooked me. So God is silent. I don't see him doing anything. He's not answering my prayers. He's overlooking me. He's never picking me. Now I'm old. And it's too late for me. So you don't want to know why I've responded in unbelief? It's because all those years when I was waiting I misunderstood. I didn't realize God was very active. Behind the scenes, God was orchestrating the events of the world to get ready to bring his son into the world. He's raising up kingdoms. He's raising up Babylon and then taking them down and raising up the Medo-Persians and tearing them down and putting Greece in them, then taking them down, putting the Romans in control, preparing the world for the coming of his son. And I thought he was silent and inactive, but in reality, he was very active. In all those years that I thought God was overlooking me, God was literally preparing and setting the stage for me to have the greatest privilege that any dad could have. And I misinterpreted it. And I think if you and I could say, well, Zachariah, what, what, what would you say to us today from this? He would say to you today, unbelief creeps in. A little disappointment, a little dashed hope, an unanswered prayer, a little misunderstanding here and there, and just over time, you can find yourself as a believer getting to the point you're not really expecting God hardly to do anything. And I've learned something in my life through the years. I've learned that every one of us here, we're all growing. We're either growing in our faith where we are trusting God more and more and more, or we're growing in our unbelief where we're expecting less and less and less. So I want to ask you today, which direction are you going? Are you expecting God 
to do greater things in your life? Are you expecting that the best is yet to come? Are you expecting your greatest years of fruitfulness are in the future? Are you expecting God to continue to work his plans in your life? Or do you think maybe you're too old and you think maybe it's passed you by and you think God's overlooked you and you think God, the, the, the fact that God hasn't answered yet, you've come to the point where you think God's not going to answer at all. And maybe you've come to the point where you are now not really expecting God to do anything or very little. And the life lesson is this, just like Zechariah misinterpreted that waiting, he thought God was neglecting him. When in reality, God was preparing for something extraordinary. Do you know that the Lord Jesus, when discussing John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus said there's never been anybody on this planet greater than him. He's the greatest guy in the sight of the Lord. He was the forerunner, the fulfillment. He's the last Old Testament prophet, the last Old Covenant prophet. He is the forerunner who paves the way for the Messiah to come. It is John who would stand there, and now he's the, he's the one anointed by God and sent to point out the Messiah so that when Jesus walks by one day, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, and God was preparing for Zechariah and Elizabeth to get to raise that boy. And they misinterpreted the whole scenario. And Zechariah would say to you and me today, when you're waiting on God, when God asks you to wait, he's not too busy, he's not overlooking you, he's, he's not unconcerned. He's preparing and setting the stage to do something wonderful for you. So don't let your heart become filled with unbelief. Don't let yourself get to where you're not expecting God to come through. And if that's you today, then you need to change your mind. You need to hear God saying to you today, I want you to keep trusting me. There's a verse found in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard. No ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts in behalf of those who wait for him. God says, if you wait for me, you'll keep trusting me and you'll keep expecting me. What I'm going to do is going to be something you could never have imagined. It'll be something beyond what you could even think of. If John, if, if Zachariah and Elizabeth could stand here today and we could say to them, let me ask you, all those years of waiting, was it worth it? What do you think they'd say? It'll be worth it for you too. I want you to bow your heads. Maybe you're watching right now, maybe you're in this room and you'd say, okay, that, that's me. I, I've, I've gotten where I'm not really expecting God to do much. then you need to repent. That means change your mind and say, oh God, I don't want to become filled with unbelief. I don't want to be expecting less and less and less of you. I want to expect more and more and more of you. So that starts with repentance, changing your mind, confessing and saying, God, forgive me for my unbelief. Fill me with faith, trust in you. Maybe there's someone here, you've been waiting on God a long time. Maybe you've been misinterpreting what's going on. And you've been kind of having your feelings hurt at God, feeling like he's overlooking you. You look around, hear everybody else's name being called. 
You see God answering other people's prayers, providing other people's needs, using other people, and you look and feel like God's overlooked you. Maybe you've been wavering. Maybe you've been struggling. Today, God wants to say to you, you've completely misunderstood what's going on. I know from your perspective, you can't see what all I'm doing. Just because I'm silent doesn't mean I'm inactive. I'm at work. I'm setting the stage. I'm preparing something wonderful. Trust me. Trust me. Keep expecting me. It'll be worth it. Maybe you're here today or you're watching and you heard Robert earlier in the service and you, you heard him talk about that he, he tried everything the world has to offer and he didn't find fulfillment and purpose and peace and joy and happiness in any of that. Well, there's pleasures of sin for a moment, but then it quickly goes away. Robert would share with you today that, man, what the most fulfilling, joyful thing in the world is Jesus. If you've never given your life to Jesus today, Jesus will change your life just like he changed Robert, just like he changed me. He'll change you. And you don't have to change yourself to try to get Jesus to accept you. You come to Jesus as you are and ask him to take you and change you. He's the one who does the changing for you. You need a savior. You need someone to save you, rescue you from your own sin. And that's what Jesus does. He's an amazing savior, an amazing God. He's just waiting for you to ask him. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be rescued, delivered, saved from their sins. So if you'd like that to be you, that could happen right now. Do you know the Bible says today is the day of salvation? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. He wants to save you, rescue you right now, right in the seat you're in, right where you're watching. So it's just waiting. His ear is inclined to you now. He's speaking to you and he's waiting for you to give him an indication you want him to save you. So if that's you, then just pray something like this. Lord Jesus, I know that I have disobeyed you a lot. And I've done a lot of things in my life you didn't want me to do. And my disobedience to you has created this barrier between us that I can't remove. The things in my life, I, I can't clean up on my own. But I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sin. You gave your life to rescue me. And I believe you rose from the dead. And I'm asking you now, right this minute, come into my life. Change me. Save me. Make me your child. Give me a relationship with God. And from this day forward, I want to follow you and serve you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and saving my life in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, then I want to welcome you to the family of God. Congratulations. You've just become a child of God, and God has just done some extraordinary things in your life, and he is going to continue to do some extraordinary things till you see him one day face to face. We celebrate with you today. 
more importantly, the Bible says there's a celebration going on in heaven right now because of you. And so we just are so happy for you. And so just like God used this church to help change Robert and Blanche's life, God would like to use this church to help you in your journey, in your relationship with Jesus. So if you prayed that prayer with me today, would you take the gray card that's in the seat back in front of you? Just put your name and a number on there or an email and just check the box that says, I prayed today to ask Jesus to save me from my sins. Drop it in the offering box as you make your way out. And we will contact you this week and, and just rejoice with you and find a time that works for you to just try to sit down and say, well, now what? What do you do now? Maybe you'd like to join the church. Just use that gray card, check the box that says, I want to pursue membership. Maybe you'd like to be baptized. Maybe you've never done that since you gave your life to Jesus. We're going to baptize a few weeks from now. It'd be a great time for you to do that. Just take the gray card, check that, drop it in the box. If you're our guest today, I want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. I hope this service was a blessing and an encouragement to you. And if it was, then if you'd take the blue card, that's in the seat back. Just fill it out. Take you about 10 seconds. Drop it in the offering box. We'd love to just connect with you this week and say thanks for coming. Well, don't forget to give your offerings to the Lord. And if you don't mind, one-time offering, if you could above your regular tithes and offerings, if you'd give to Jesus today, to those people that are homeless who need the love of Jesus, you can do that by just writing Brookhaven Church, check right down the corner, homeless ministry or something like that or you can do it online and just put ministry to the homeless and if you'll do that then we will get all that money to them uh this week and we will um we'll start blessing those people in the name of jesus so thank you thank you thank you for doing that i appreciate it let's stand together let's pray together father You're more amazing than we know. You're more gracious, more merciful, more loving. You don't, we we can't even begin to comprehend a God as great as you, as colossal as you, as powerful as you. And that you would have a plan for each of our lives. We're not an accident. We're not a mistake. We're designed and created by you for purpose. And you have something great planned. And you've asked a number of people that are here today to wait. We all go through times of waiting. And when we do, we're tempted to misinterpret and misunderstand and falsely accuse you and think, oh God, that you don't care. And I pray that today you would encourage your people to know that you're at work and you've got something great planned for them. So strengthen their faith. And I pray that today, Lord, if anyone's here in unbelief, I pray that today they would turn from that and you would fill, their, fill them with a heart that is growing in their expectation of you. Bless your people today. Bless them as they go through this week. And may you use all of us to be your representatives in the world this week. May we talk to others about you. And I thank you, Lord, for this time of year where we just stop and we're awed with your amazing humility and love that you would come into the world to be our Savior. We adore you. We love you. It is an honor to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.